Good evening, everybody. It's time for us to get started. I want to welcome you to Green Hill. I know uh, I'm thankful for as many people that's here. I didn't figure there'd be this many because of Thanksgiving, everybody home cooking. But uh, thank you for coming out and being with us tonight. I want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving tomorrow. Uh, hope you and your families get together, and, and I know most of you will have plenty to eat, so I want to I wish you a, a happy Thanksgiving, and uh, don't eat too much like me. But uh, we've got a few announcements I want to make tonight. Uh, <clears throat> David Beggarly called out sick, said he was uh, sick, and almost passed out or something and then uh, uh, James is going to be leading her singer singing I'll have the first prayer and then Lance will have the closing prayer at the appropriate time Bill Paul is in life care and I'm not sure whether he has went back to his original place or not yet but he was hoping the first of the week that he would get to go back uh, Mark Rocco has some blockages in his legs and he didn't ha get to have his uh, test or his annual grams uh, Monday. They're having some problems, and he's trying to get that worked out. So hopefully that'll be in the near future. Kathy goes next Thursday, December the 1st, to see the surgeon to see what they can do with her arm. Hopefully there's something that they can do to get that fixed. Peggy Cantwell is recovering from the flu, and she was here Sunday, and doing real well. Uh, Keith Cross is a uh, uh, cousin of Carla. They've stopped his radiation and chemo. Is that right, Carla? They said the cancer was spreading everywhere, so they just stopped it. Uh, we need to keep them in our prayers. Dennis Adams and Carlene is both home. Uh, Carlene's doing fairly well, but Dennis is not doing well at all. Our sympathy goes out to Brandon and his family for the loss of their aunt last week. That funeral was Thursday up at the Hermitage Memorial Gardens. And again, I want to thank Juanita and Kenneth and Shirley and Randy for all of the uh, work that they did to put this uh, Thanksgiving baskets together for our shut-in and stuff. They did a good job, and all of them sure appreciated it. Uh, Joy Page is back in town. You know, her brother had a bad car accident in Alabama. They came back in town, but they're leaving to go back out of town down there. So uh, we'll keep our prayers going for him also. Kenny George, Iron Man, went to the doctor, and his test come back perfect. Everything was fine, and we're so thankful for that. Kenny, we, we're, prayer really does work. So we've been praying for Kenny for going on two years now, and uh, it's paid off. Uh, JJ, little JJ, she's home, got the flu. So uh, keep JJ in your prayers and hope everything uh, goes well for her. Did we leave anybody out or anything? Anybody know of anything that we need to announce? Okay, bow with me. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day. Thank you for our health. Thank you for giving us the time to come here to hear another lesson from Brother Mike. We pray, Father, that we will be attentive and listen to the message that's given, that we'll be able to use it in our everyday life. And we pray, Father, as we all get together as families tomorrow, that we will revisit our our religious matters with them and, and encourage them the best that we can if we have any that's fell away or has not been going to the worship services we pray Father that we'll get the opportunity tomorrow to talk to them and speak to them about that we thank you for the time that we can come and give thanksgiving every, each and every day to you for all the blessings that you give us especially on the Lord's Day for your son that you gave us that we may have eternal life through him. Be with Brother Black tonight. Be with all these I just mentioned as sick that uh, they may recover from their illnesses and be able to be back with us here at Green Hill.
forgive us of our many sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First song will be number 616. 616. Sing all three verses. <clears throat> I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one that silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we'll never more wander, but walk the streets that are pure as gold. Though often tempted, tormented and tested, and like the prophet, my pillow's a stone. And though I find here no permanent dwelling, I know he'll give me a mansion of my own. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never go hold. And someday yonder we'll never more wander, but walk the streets that are purest gold. Don't think me poor or deserted or lonely. I'm not discouraged. I'm heaven bound. I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a robe and a crown. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never go old. And someday yonder we'll never more wander but walk the streets that are pure as gold. Please mark number 218 is our song after Mike's lesson. 218. And once you have that mark, please turn to 526. 526. Sing the first and fourth stanzas. We're just a passing through. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be left home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be left home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore. And I can't be let home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? 
The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be left home in this world anymore. Happy Thanksgiving. Good to see everybody tonight. I hope that you're all off to a good start. And if you are traveling for the holidays, we pray that you'll have safe travels. And if you have people coming your way, we hope that they'll be safe in their journey as well. We're all going to overeat at some point. I've never heard a sermon on gluttony. I've never heard a sermon on gluttony. So we can start out with being thankful about that, okay? So people joke about that from time to time, and I think it. Uh, it's not as much that we're going to want to overeat, but we don't want to disappoint those who cook the food. I think that's mostly, mostly what it comes down to. It's our civic duty. It's our civic duty to take and to eat everything that's put on our plate, whether someone serves it to us or whether we lathered it on and piled it up ourselves. So I hope that you have a lot of good memories of past Thanksgivings, and I hope that this year will be uh, likewise a time of good thoughts and contentment. It's going to be different for several of us. My mother passed away, of course, in July, so this would be our first Thanksgiving without her. And uh, But that's okay, too, because as we trust in God, we know to be thankful, and we also know to be content, and hence the lesson tonight, be content and be thankful. So when we think about what it means to be content, look at these definitions. Independence from outside circumstances, the opposite of unrest, worry, or anxiety. Okay, independence from outside circumstances. What are some outside circumstances that sometimes cause us not to be content? What are some of those things? Outside circumstances. Weather, okay. Everything. A little bit more specific. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can you think of any outside circumstances that affect our contentment? Yes. All right, health issues, sure, yeah, yeah. What else? Family, okay. Pardon me, Emily? Yeah, okay, she's, she's ditto to that, okay. All right, so there are a lot of outside forces that, that determine our happiness, and they really shouldn't, should they? I mean, for one thing, it's taken us years to get to the level of, of not letting your happiness or sadness be determined by 17, 18, and 19-year-olds as they're playing ball games, right? I mean, some of them are going to be millionaires in a few months anyway, but if they win or if they lose, what does that have to do with our happiness? Really, if you didn't know that the games were being played, wouldn't you be a lot happier in, in many ways? I, I'm not dispelling the, the value of sports. I like sports. I enjoy it, particularly when we win. But when we lose, you know, it has a, a chilling effect on us. But isn't it something that when you don't know about bad things, it doesn't really affect you? For example, several years ago, my mom and dad came down to Atlanta to spend some time with us. And while they were there, my dad got a phone call, and his aunt had been killed in a, in a car wreck. And so they turned around and went back to Kentucky, and he performed uh, my aunt's uh, funeral a few days later. Well, while he was gone, they couldn't reach him at first. And... So we were enjoying our time together. That was an outside circumstance that had no bearing whatsoever on our actions or attitude because we simply did not know. And because we didn't know, it didn't affect us. Now, once we knew, we were sad because June uh, was the youngest of eight, and, and uh, you know there were just so many things there that, uh, that caused us sadness. But contentment, again, independence from outside circumstances, the opposite of unrest, worry, or anxiety. There's some things in this world you cannot change. I cannot make it rain, although I have preached up a storm a time or two, and, and there have been people that said, oh, you should have warned us, we would have brought an umbrella, but I'm just taking credit for the storm after it's already there. I didn't cause it to rain. I can't cause the sun to shine. I can't ca cause the snow to go away. We can't change those circumstances. Also, contentment is when we are convinced that our resources in Jesus are more than adequate for every situation we will face in life. Now, as we grow older, we realize, yeah, the answers are all here. What page? I don't know all the time, okay? But the answers are all here. And so we know that we've got to find some sort of answer here for every situation we're in. The, 
the trick though, the, the process that we go through to find that is to just be always immersed in the word to where it's just second nature that it comes to us. That our, our first response to the situation ought to be to stop and to pray or to go to God in prayer in some way and fashion to open up his word or to ask ourselves audibly out loud, well, what would Jesus do in this situation? What would he want me to do in this situation? And so again, contentment is not only not allowing those things on the outside to affect our happiness or cause us worry and stress and anxiety, but also it's to realize that our contentment only really comes in Jesus. I mean, if you knew, if you knew that there was no way that you were going to lose, you'd be all right. Carl and I, for years before we had uh, the ability to back up our TV and, and watch things, you know, pause it and go back and watch, like many of you, we would use the VHS cartridges and we would tape a ball game. They would play ball games while we were at church, and, and so when we get home, uh, we would pop that tape in to watch. Now, we had a, we had a thing already. If we knew that we lost, we didn't watch that game because there's no sense in watching that game. But if we had won the game, we went ahead and watched that VHS tape. I want to tell you, it did not stop my wife one minute from criticizing that coach or the referees or me either one. Even though we knew that we would win the game, that frustration, the anger, as well as the happiness and the jubilance, all of those emotions were real, even though this was a recorded event, and we knew the outcome. We still had that anxiety during those times. Listen, we've already won, those of us that are in Christ. We already have a place that's reserved for us in heaven. Uh, there's nothing on this earth that can affect us unless we ourselves surrender to the devil, which I, for one, I'm not going to do. So when we learn contentment, when we learn that all we need is in Jesus Christ, what we're doing is, give me your best shot, world. Right? I'll get up tomorrow, something's going to go wrong. Okay, give me your best shot. I'm going to deal with it the best I can. Maybe it's not the best reaction at first. Maybe we work out the wrinkles as we go. But whatever has happened to you and whatever has happened to me so far, guess what? We got through it. We're survivors. And we didn't do all that on our own. We trusted in God. So let's be thankful. Nothing on earth lasts or satisfies fully. It's not going to satisfy us fully. I used to really enjoy eggnog. Okay, I'm talking about the store-bought eggnog, not the homemade stuff that people know. No, I mean, I mean the store-bought. And for years, I would always like that. Carla couldn't understand why I liked that. And yet, every now and then, the temptation would be just so strong, I'll go ahead and buy a quart, and I'll drink a half a glass, and the rest of it would be poured down the drain later on. But I just I have this notion. I, I want it, and then once I have it, I don't really want it anymore. When I was in college studying business, there was a concept of uh, the principle of diminishing returns. And the way that they explained this has really stuck with me all throughout the years, although I don't drink coffee anymore. I used to when I was in, 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 the, in the corporate world. But in the concept of diminishing returns, that doctrine or theory, they said that first cup of coffee has your highest uh, appreciation level. That's what you want. That's what you cuddle in the morning when it's cold. That's when you just sip on it. It's just all soothing and your synapses and everything. Just all It all works together. By the time you're on your fifth cup of coffee, it, it's not as satisfying as that first cup because there's a diminishing return, you see, and it's the same with anything else that we have. And whatever it is that brings you joy or pleasure today, it's not going to last forever. Nothing on earth lasts or satisfies fully. There's a diminishing return to everything. If you work for money and get enough money, it's not going to be enough because after a while you're going to say, I could have 10 times as much. And so you set another goal and then you're after that. Same thing with ice cream or whatever else is in our life. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 8 says, All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. Now Solomon, the wise man here, he's going through and he's saying, Listen, everything we do in life is about pursuing something but yet we're never going to really fully attain what we think we're going to attain in this life. So back again to that point, nothing on earth lasts or satisfies fully. So we've got to find contentment in something, in something. It's not going to be in items around us or in the things that we acquire or even in our relationships fully because nothing lasts or satisfies fully. 
All right, the next, oh, oh, here's another passage on that. 2 Corinthians 4, let's see what Paul says, verses 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. He's talking about our old bodies are starting to deteriorate, yet our inward man is being renewed every time we get up because we're pulling our strength and, and, uh, and our value from God. For our light affliction, and, and he talks about this in about chapter 11 or so, about what his light affliction might be. You remember he was shipwrecked, he was beaten so many times, he was in danger and perils of his countrymen and all these people wanting to do evil things to him. And here he's saying, our light affliction. He's talking about being beaten and being in prison. And he's considering that light affliction. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, and the things which are not seen are eternal. So it's not the things that we see that's going to bring us that joy and lasting, uh, lasting happiness. It's the eternal things that we're really going to, to go through. My sisters and I going through some of my mother's stuff yesterday before all the rest of the family comes tomorrow, and we divide up the rest of her physical belongings. It's a very emotional time when we're going through, and we see things, and we knew that certain items meant a lot to mom and dad and, and to us as individuals, but the things, they don't, they don't hold any real value to us. I mean, it's a sentimental value. But anything that you had, we have, have just traded all that back in just for another hour with her. See, the things that last aren't the physical things. It's the eternal things. And those are the things that we need to focus on. Acquiring things does not equal contentment. How many people in here ever collected Beanie Babies? You remember Beanie Babies? Okay, yeah, all right. Yeah, don't be too much, uh, I'll get on fishing lures in a minute or something else, and she'll, she'll be talking about you. All right, so when we go to acquire things, all right, it, it's nice as a hobby, it's nice to say, let's go and do this. I had a certain artist, uh, he's been uh, dead for quite a number of years, but a Kentucky artist by the name of C. Don Enzer, and he... He, he painted a lot of primitives. He did some mules. That's the way I was introduced to him. There were four mule portraits in La Carla's living room over the couch when I started dating her. And so those mules were always there. And so C. Don Enzer had been a part of my life for uh, over 40 years, you know, knowing that. So I got on a kick after a little while. I wonder, you know, I saw one or two for sale at a, at a uh, peddler's mall, and I bought them. I thought, well, I, I need to have all four of those mules. And so I bought the other two. And then I thought, well, here's another one. And I bought that one. Before long, I was collecting everything Don Enzer. And then it became the game of what do I not have that I could have? And I'm getting on eBay, and I'm scouring the websites, and I'm just looking just to acquire it. Do you know where all those Enzers are now? They're stacked up against a wall, and I've got about 20 of them unframed under a bed. I mean, they're of absolutely no use to me. I, I know that they have some value to somebody, but that person hasn't been introduced to me yet. So I, I've tried to sell them. Nobody wants them. Nobody cares about this or that. But I collected them. Acquiring things does not equal contentment. Now, it was nice to collect it just because I think you need to have something to pursue in life. And if you've got to walk through a peddler mall, you may as well be looking for something. Uh, because if you're not looking for that, you're going to fall for something else. So you may as well have something that you want to have. But acquiring things, it's not going to find us with contentment. Ecclesiastes 2, verses 10 and 11. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done, and on the labor in which I had toiled, and indeed all was vanity and grasping profit under the sun. Now the concept of vanity is all throughout here, and things that are vain, uh, in, in the sense, would be empty, empty. And, and, and the wise man just keeps grappling with this. I, I did everything. Look, I didn't withhold anything from me that I wanted. I got every single thing that I wanted. And yet when I looked around afterwards, it was what? It was vanity and grasping for the wind. It was not something that provided him with contentment. 
we need to seek God and godliness first. Was that God calling? I don't know. I don't. I'm sorry. It's only because you that I mentioned that. Gives me a chance to tell a story. You know, with a preacher, there's never any bad things that happen to you that can't be turned into a good bulletin article or a sermon illustration at some point. I was in the Rotary Club in Mayfield, Kentucky years ago, and back when I would wear my phone on my belt, a little flip phone, and, you know, you'd have the little clip. And uh, the sheriff was our sergeant at arms, which is a little intimidating when the guy comes in with a gun. <laughs> He's your sergeant at arms. And, and uh, he was also uh, uh, a neighbor of mine across the street and, and a good Baptist, a good Baptist. And he teased me about being the Church of Christ preacher. Anyway, we were getting ready for, uh, for our prayer one day, and my phone went off. I usually left it in the truck, but my phone went off. And, and as I'm, I'm opening it up and closing it, you, you do that, that real quick. And I happened to look up, and John Davis was looking right at me. And I'm like, oh, this is going to cost me. He's going to find me. And sure enough, when it came after the prayer, he came around, you know, assessing his fines, and he was, he was uh, you know, on to me. He said something about that the, the Baptist prayer wasn't good enough, so Mike was trying to make his call into God to make his own prayer. I wasn't thinking quick enough on my feet. If I had been thinking, I would say, John, it was an incoming call. I wasn't calling him. He was calling me. But at any rate, uh, that's, that's good. And also, years ago, I had a friend of mine in Lexington. He's one of the elders up there now in the church. And they had a really nice brass plaque when you came in and said, please turn your cell phones and beepers off. And, and he said, no matter what we do, people still come in and their phones go off. And, and the only advice I could give them, I said, that happens to us all the time. And it's happened to me. And I said, the only thing I can tell you is just about two or three minutes before church starts, just take your phone out and call somebody who doesn't have their phone on. <laughs> And once they hear that go off, you know, everybody else in the auditorium will turn their, their phone off. So I wonder, how, how many people turn their phones off after the one went off right now? Maybe, no, okay. Well, you're still a good example for us, Richard. <laughs> Medicare. Medicare call, okay. That was BoxCast calling and say thank you for being on time when you start. Hey, by the way, I, I just have to clear the air here, you know. Uh, I was listening Sunday morning, and I heard Richard say loud and clear, we're not under any time limit. The preacher, Mike Baker's not even here, so we don't have to stay on time today. So I, I think so, yeah. I, I think so. So just remember all of us now, you know, you're, you're being recorded, and, and, and if I don't know it, God does. So. We need to seek God and, his, and godliness first in our lives. Colossians 3 is a great chapter. Listen to the first three verses here. Paul says, If then you were raised with Christ, that is, we've been buried with him, we've been raised with him in baptism, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's such a simple concept. It's so difficult for us to always put that in perspective. Set your mind where? Where should I set my mind? On things above, not on things of the earth. Yeah, we need to take care of business here, but set your mind on things uh, in heaven, not on things of the earth. First Timothy 6, 6 through 8, Paul says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Okay, So we know this, right? I mean, we come into this world, we're born, we don't have anything with us, we're at the total mercy of everyone around us. And sometimes when we get ready to depart this world, we are at the total mercy of others around us to take care of us during that time as well. But the only thing that survives this life with us is going to be our eternal spirit. That's it. That's it. Our bank accounts don't come with us. Uh, you know, your, your designer clothes don't come with you. Uh, whatever it is, nothing else is going to come with you. So also, we need to learn to rejoice. Now, just a few minutes ago, we were laughing, and I, I think Christians ought to smile and laugh a lot more. And so there are times that I'll interject some humor, like we're doing tonight, and it's never really planned. Anytime I plan to tell a joke, it never goes well. But sometimes I'll think of something, or sometimes I just make a mistake, and, and the joke's on me, and I don't find out till later what I did. But we need to rejoice. We need to be joyful people. You know, Christians don't need to be walking around looking like they've been sucking on lemons all day long. They just, you know, sour look on and sour disposition 
We need to be joyful people. We all need to be anxious about things. Just don't be anxious. You can't speed up time. You can't make tomorrow come any faster or push it out any further. Tomorrow's going to come when tomorrow was scheduled to come. And so whatever it is that we're going through, uh, you know, Kenny with his cancer and all the things going through, when he started that first round of chemo, not knowing, you know, how it's going to go, he didn't know how long that journey was going to really take. And now he's cancer-free. It's going to be another three months or so before he has to go back. And isn't it wonderful? I mean, every day is a gift, right? Every day is a gift from God. And what we're doing is we're, we're taking the things that we can change and we're saying, God, you take care of this. Okay? God, you take care of this. I'm going to do what I can do. I'm going to see the right doctors. I'm going to have the right treatment. Uh, I'm pretty sure you prescribed going out on the lake on your boat and, and doing so. I'm pretty sure that was in writing somewhere. But I'm going to do those things that are important for my health. And God, the rest of it's in your hands. Yes, I, I am. I'm pre I always preach to myself first, Rich. I know, I know. I've got what, what, what day is my appointment, Carl? It's uh, Jan January 18th. January 18th. So I'm, I'm going to be here. But don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. So let's look at Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, Rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. That's hard. That's hard. There's so many unknown things that lie ahead, and we just don't know how we're going to deal with them. Don't know how we're going to deal with them. Now, I've preached about worry before, and there's always examples about people who worry that, you know, at the end of the process they say, See, I was such a good person at worrying, none of the things I worried about ever happened. Well, what a waste of time. What a waste of time. I mean, there are things that you can control and things that you can't control. The things that you can't control, don't worry about it. Your worrying's not going to change one thing about it. Don't be anxious for anything. But I don't know how I'm going to survive, or I don't know how this is going to be fine. Being anxious, worrying is not really going to help. If you need information on how to do things the next day or the next uh, section, uh, section of your life, then learn and acquire what you need to learn and acquire. But don't be anxious over it. Lots of changes happen in our lives, all right? Death, sickness, changes in employment, changes in health. All, all these things come about, and they, they change. Don't worry about these things. Um, Carla and I have been married just a short period of time, a year and a half when her brain tumor came about, and lots of things changed in our life from that point on. Do you think we were worried, anxious? Oh, sure. I mean, we had all that stuff. We were young. Nobody had ever experienced that in our family. But through this whole process, boy, I tell you what, God can see you through all kinds of things. And the things that we could have worried about and, and could, have, could have focused on, well, why do that? Why do that? Because you don't know what's going to happen. Plan, yes. Have alternatives already mapped out in your mind, but don't be anxious. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, what are, what are the requests when we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow? God, <laughs> help me know what to do tomorrow. All right? I don't know how I can do this without my husband, or I don't know how I can do this without this job, or I don't know how I can do this without this health. Whatever it is, let your request be made known to God. Lift those up to God. Don't be anxious, but do what? Go to God in prayer. Get on your knees. Get in your closet or out on your back porch. Pray out loud. Pray to God. Let your request be made to God. And guess what happens? The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It doesn't say God's going to solve every problem. What does it say is going to happen? The peace of God. That peace that we can't understand. It surpasses understanding. And that word there for guard is a military term. It means like a, a, a military sentry just standing right over what he's guarding. Okay? God gave us the, the prescription, the formula to follow to rid ourselves of anxiousness and worry. Let those requests be made known to God. We also need to learn to meditate and experience the peace of God. To meditate. Uh, 
I get in trouble sometimes for meditating because I should be listening to my wife at that particular moment. And so sometimes I you know, have to have something repeated. That's all right. There you go. But that's not the type of meditation we're talking about. Meditate. Meditate on the Word of God, on what it really means. If you read the Bible on a daily basis or a regular basis, whatever your time of day is, I hope that you have a specific time of day that you just block out and say, this is my time to sit and read the Bible. Maybe it's a column, maybe it's a chapter, or maybe it's two or three chapters at a time. But just dwell on that. Meditate. If you mark in your Bible as I mark in mine, just look at the things that you marked in the past. Try to remember, well, who was it that talked about this in 1 Timothy? Who, who was it that said this where I underlined this word glorified? Meditate on what that means. Focus on that. And again, what we're doing is we're trying to be content and thankful, and this is the prescription we have. Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9. Finally, brethren, Paul says, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Here again, we've got the God of peace, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. How do I gain that peace? How do I know to be at peace with myself during this circumstance? Several of us have been around families during their difficult times when they receive bad news from the doctor or from a policeman or something else. I've sat with families before in the funeral parlors and, and uh, in the waiting areas, uh, waiting to see the, uh, the people to make arrangements. I've seen the confusion in the faces of people who never thought that this day would come when somebody that they loved would die, and they have no connection with God whatsoever. They don't know what's next, and they don't know how to handle that situation. I've also sat in those same situations with brothers and sisters in Christ, and when those situations came up, there was obviously a sadness, but there was a peace as well, a real peace, because there is something beyond this mortal. We have to understand also that the power is in Christ, not in us. We can't do everything on our own. We have to rely on the power in Christ. Philippians 4, again, verses 11 through 13, he says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound, as he knows how to, how to have these things and knows how not to do them with them. Everywhere and in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now that last verse there, verse 13, oftentimes is used out of context. I can do all things through Christ who, who strengthens me. I can go out here and I can play uh, professional ball and, and, and dunk, uh, on Charles Barkley or whoever else might be out there. Well, I mean, Charles is pretty slow now, but he's still a much better ball player than I am. But that's not what we're talking about when he says, I can do all things through Christ. Listen, there are limits to what we can do, but did you ever think that you'd get through some of the problems in your life? I mean, there was always doubt in some of our minds. That, I don't know how we're going to get through this. I don't, I don't know how we're going to make ends meet, or I don't know how this relationship is going to work out, or I don't know how to pay for this. Listen, through Christ, we get our, our power, this is where we get our confidence, is in our relationship with Jesus. And again, go back to this concept that you already know the end. It's like us watching the, the ball game that's on a VHS tape. We already know that we're going to win, but the emotions are still there. We still argue with the refs over the call. We still call out the coach over some bonehead substitution or whatever he's done. We, we still have those anger moments as well as the moments of joy because those are real moments that we experience, even though we know the outcome of the game. And for Christians, we need to learn that contentment comes from knowing we already know the outcome of the game. We already know the time comes and our family and friends gather around and, and say the final goodbyes, the mortal remains, we're already in a much better place. So whatever happens between now and then, the emotions still go up and down. The feelings are still there. The anxiety still is going to creep in. But how do you have the peace? How do you have the peace that God surrounds you with? Like that nice warm blanket when you're chilled. How do you have that peace and comfort? You 
got to find it in God and his ways. We need to trust that God will supply our needs. Not like the lady in Georgia that called me and wanted me to pay her electric bill because some TV preacher said that churches should pay all of her bills. She had a job. She just was calling to churches, and they were paying her bills. And I'm like, nope, no, we're not going to do that. That's not the way God supplies your needs. Again, Philippians 4, 19 and 20. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory doesn't say my God's going to provide you with a Rolex and a Porsche. Your need. I've never known a faithful Christian to starve to death. I've never known a faithful Christian to be out on the streets homeless. You know why? Because God's family is there. I've known lots of people who turn their back on God and experience part hardships and other uh, problems in life, but I've never personally known. Now, I've known some people that, one in particular, who went off his meds and some other things happened so that he wasn't uh, accepted and, and, and didn't integrate in the local church, and, and he did die alone. But that was a mental issue. But listen, my God shall supply all your needs. Beyond our biological families, we are so blessed to have God's family that surrounds us to where wherever we go, we're going to find somebody. and We're going to find a connection. When I was in Orlando, one of the great things I had to do there was to greet everyone when they came in, walk around, and there would always be some guests from out of town. And I love the challenge. Where are you from? Oh, we're from Tennessee. Great part. West Tennessee. Wonderful. What part? Oh, you wouldn't know it. It's a small little town. Oh, go ahead and tell me. Hohenwald. Oh, Hohenwald. Yeah. Do you go to Pine, uh, Pine View or Lomax? You know, I know both the preachers out there. I had a, a gospel meeting at Pine View. Oh, we used to go to Pine View. Great. Doesn't take long when you're God's family to where you have something in common. Rely on that. Learn to be content and to be thankful. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And this is where we're going to stop for tonight. Because I want us to see that in everything that we look at in life, we can be much richer, much more fulfilled, if we can learn to be content and thankful. Be content and be thankful. I don't know about you, but when we, uh, when we experience those in the service industry now after COVID, many of these places that we go to, to do commerce with, to buy goods, or to go and to be fed at a restaurant, they don't have the same staff that they used to have. Many of them are short, short-handed, and they're, they're strained. And sometimes it's not as good a service, not, sometimes it's not as good a food. But I, I've experienced over my lifetime that if I am grateful and thankful for who's there, they tend to give me better service. So when I'm polite and I say thank you, when I call the waitress or waiter by their name, uh, when I interact with them in a good positive way to encourage them, I find that their service to me is much better. I think their value to that organization is better, and I firmly believe that it's contagious, and they will help other people to do a better job as well. And all of that starts with us being content and being thankful. James has done a great job leading us in song tonight. He has a song that's designed for our encouragement. And if any of you would desire the prayers of the church or to, uh, to have this time as your time to put on Christ in baptism, we encourage you to let us know that now while we stand and while we sing.
guys a great Thanksgiving tomorrow and Friday, Saturday, whenever you get a chance to get together with your family. If you travel, please travel safe. Uh, we want to see all of you back uh, on our, the next time we gather. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. God and our Father in heaven, we come to you as humble as we know how, thanking you for all the many wonderful blessings you give to us each and every day. Father, thank you for watching over the sick and guiding the doctors and nurses that care for them. Thank you, Father, for comforting those that have lost loved ones. Father, please continue to keep your hands on the men and women in uniform that fight for our freedoms each and every day. As we gather around the table tomorrow or the, whenever that we get a chance to be with family, God, please keep in mind that all things are through, are through you and your son, Jesus Christ, and without, without Jesus it wouldn't be possible. Most of all, Father, thank you for your son, Jesus, and the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus made for us in order for our sins to be forgiven. For this prayer is in Jesus' most blessed and holy name we pray. Amen. She's, th she's thinking about that EMT guy that came to her house.